across the country, doctors and nurses are volunteering to fly to the epicenter of the pandemic in the United States to help treat coronavirus patients in New York City. Emergency room doctor Larry Burchette was among them, and he just got back to the Bay Area after the rewarding yet exhausting experience. Here to talk about it is Dr. Burchette himself. Thanks for taking the time. You must still be recovering from that trip. I, I feel pretty good. It's been almost a week, and I've uh, been able to get back into the swing of things here in the Bay. Fantastic. So tell me, how did you decide that you wanted to do all of this for free and then put yourself in the middle of the hardest hit region right now? You know, um, a few weeks ago when I was thinking about it, they kept saying that the that California and the ERs where I worked with was a week or two behind the surge that was happening in New York. And so, you know, we were hearing all this stuff coming from Italy and that it was very critical and overwhelming over there. And I thought it was going to happen in California. We were all prepared. We had all these contingency plans. And then we flattened the curve here, you know, with good policies and everybody doing their part. And I just felt like I was on the sidelines, you know, and that there was something big going on that I could contribute to and, and help. I just didn't feel like I could stay here. And it, it worked out timing wise where I was off that I could go to New York and volunteer and and it happened. So you were there for about a week, but you described it as emotionally draining. Tell me about that. I was in New York for a week with a buddy working in a hospital that on a floor that had all COVID patients. Um, it was intense. It, it's the same stuff that we deal with in medicine, victories and losses and failures and, and difficult times, you know, at end of life and, and trying to get patients and families through it. But with coronavirus, it was just more amplified, you know, people were sicker. It was harder because there was no visitation and families couldn't come in and it's difficult to communicate serious things over the phone when they can't see it. All of it was, it was all of those emotions up and down, but just on such a more intense scale. And it was seven days in a row. Now, I mean, I've been out of residency for 10 or 11 years. It's been a long time since I worked seven days in a row. It, it was exhausting. What kind of a mindset did you go into this with? And now that you have seen this firsthand, um, what have you taken away from that experience? I think the mindset that I headed into it was that it was going to be difficult. It was going to be a war zone. It was going to be brutal the whole week. And I, I, I don't think I anticipated how many victories we would have, how many people survived and were discharged. It wasn't as bad as the stuff, again, two weeks before where you see these images of, you know, the tractor trailer being used to hold cold, you know, bodies and all that stuff. It wasn't that bad, but it was still, it was still bad. You know, this disease is nothing that I've ever seen before. Not only can it cause kind of the lung failure that everybody's talked about, but it causes a ton of kidney failure, needing dialysis. We had patients with, with a form of heart failure, myocarditis. Um, it can cause clots in the lungs and legs and people can suddenly get sicker. I've never seen any disease that can do all of these things from one virus and, and be so deadly. After seeing this kind of firsthand, you know, my, my perspective on this stuff, like now today is as we reopen this economy, God, we gotta be really, really careful because this is bad stuff. And I'm just worried that it's so contagious that people are gonna get People, people are absolutely going to get sick and die as we reopen this economy. It just worries me. Having seen it, it firsthand, it worries me much more than it did beforehand. It's bad stuff. This is the real thing. It's bad. It's a bad, it's a bad boy. And uh, it seems like you were really stunned to see how quickly the negative impacts from this virus ended up worsening to the point that somebody might have looked fine at one point. And then all of a sudden I saw in your Instagram videos that they were just breaking out in a sweat and needed to be put on a ventilator as soon as possible. Yeah, one of the characteristic unique things about this COVID disease, and I heard this from a lot of the doctors there, I got there and they said, you know, it's crazy how fast people can get sick. Sometimes you get an illness and it gradually gets worse over days, but the, but with COVID, like people that seem fine can just take a turn. We had two patients that that happened to. One patient we rounded on in the morning, he looked fine. He wasn't even there for a respiratory reason and, and COVID. And then in the afternoon, he just got sick so fast and he ended up being put on a breathing machine. 
that was pretty impressive. Again, this is like a characteristic of this thing that when people get sick, it, it can happen fast. Part of the message is if you get this and you're short of breath, you need to come in and be evaluated because you can get sick fast. So what other tools did you guys have in order to try and treat these COVID-19 patients? Uh, my understanding is that once somebody is put on a ventilator, the chances of them coming out of that are pretty slim. You know, there's different numbers about how bad is it once they're on a ventilator. It all depends on how sick are they, how old are they, how many other medical conditions do they have. If multiple organ systems are failing and then they get put on the ventilator, that is so much worse than if it's just their respiratory system. Again, what, what the guys told me when I was there was in the beginning, it seemed, it really did seem like these numbers, these 80, 90% of people on the vent died. And then they threw the kitchen sink at it. They were, they were tr using every medicine, not only hydroxychloroquine and, and uh, convalescent plasma and all of these other uh, uh, meds, steroids, putting them on blood thinners. They feel like something worked to help treat it those numbers are probably, again, this is all anecdote. I, I don't have really good kind of academic numbers, but it seemed like something in there in that cocktail really worked to help people get better. Um, and so the numbers are probably better than 80 or 90% of people dying on a ventilator. One of my uh, colleagues that works in Denver in the ICU, she feels like their death rate in the ICU is about 20%. So certainly when you get to that stage, it's very serious. Um, but I don't think it's as bad as that 80, 90 percent. One of the interesting things that I was there that, again, that these guys told me, I thought that the problem was going to be when the system gets overwhelmed, you run out of ventilators, you run out of ICU beds. But what they told me was one of the biggest things they ran out of was the ability to do dialysis for kidney failure. So when your kidneys fail, you can use a machine to filter the blood. That's called dialysis. In New York, at this particular hospital, their dialysis nurses got sick. And at one point they were only down to one dialysis nurse. Well, it takes about two hours to do dialysis for one patient. But they had people that died of kidney failure because they were not able to do dialysis. That surprised me. I thought it was gonna be all about vents. Do we have enough ventilators? That's been in the conversation. But for them, dialysis was something that was a big deal that they, they ran out of the capacity to do. Again, some, not something that you would, that would have anticipated. And that's really telling about the type of people who are contracting coronavirus and then getting the worst of the side effects. We understand that it's mostly people who do have underlying health conditions and who might be vulnerable to a passing from something else. Um, have you noticed maybe in, you know, the thick of things and it being so hectic, is it possible to really, you know, label on their medical records what they exactly died from, whether it was the underlying health condition or, you know, if they came in and had COVID-19, is it just being written off as COVID-19? You know, um, I know there's a big discussion now about what is the actual cause of death. And, and there's a, a couple things to think about. So coronavirus can cause all kinds of serious medical conditions. We just talked about it. It can cause respiratory failure where you need to be on a ventilator. You've probably heard about that. It can cause kidney failure where you need to be on dialysis. Uh, it can cause a form of heart failure and clots in the lungs. Any of those four things can kill somebody. You can die of kidney failure. You can die of heart failure. Um, but the underlying disease, then you ask the question, well, what caused the kidney failure? Well, it was coronavirus. So the underlying cause of death, and this is how it goes on the death, on the, on the uh, you know, as an ER doctor and a hospital doctor, I filled out countless, uh, you know, official death forms for the state. And the first thing on there, it says, what's the immediate cause of death? Well, that would be like respiratory failure, cardiorespiratory arrest, kidney failure. And you go down to the underlying cause, and then you get to the kind of final underlying cause, in this case, would be COVID. Like the disease that caused the kidney failure is coronavirus. The next line under that is it says something like, well, what are the associated medical conditions that contributed to that? So if somebody had diabetes, uh, and then they had kidney failure from coronavirus, or they um, smoked their whole life, their lungs weren't in great shape, and they had emphysema to begin with. Those are underlying medical conditions that absolutely contribute to it, but it's the COVID, it's the coronavirus disease that actually kills them, and that's what the underlying cause of death is. The immediate cause of death is kind of the final thing that really did it. 
sometimes it can be difficult. To, sometimes it can be difficult to sort that out. If somebody's on a ventilator and their lungs have failed and they're on dialysis for their kidneys and they die, sometimes it's like, well, which one is it? It can be difficult. Either way, the underlying cause of death is coronavirus. When it comes down to the statistics and we end up looking back at what worked, what didn't, is there kind of a hard time in differentiating between those as well, whether it was actually um, one drug over the other? Look, this is a great time for academic medicine and studies and research to take the forefront in this battle. We really don't know exactly what the best medication is right now. First, it was hydroxychloroquine. Uh, it doesn't look like that does very much. Now there was this study that remdesivir, you know, maybe it improves the mortality from 11 to 8%, so it helps a little bit. Some people think that steroids can help people survive by fighting the cytokine storm or the body's immune system reaction to the virus. Um, other people think that, you know, one of the big ways people die is they get clots in their lungs or legs from coronavirus, and so they should be on blood thinners. Maybe something in there or a combination does work, but really right now, we're not sure. We don't know. Again, what I saw was throwing the kitchen sink at it, and these guys felt that something made a difference with good studies and research. Uh, we need to figure out what that is, you know, to give the people that are sick in the hospital their best chance. People are told that it's more the elderly who are susceptible and most vulnerable to um, ending up dying or feeling the worst side effects of having this virus. Is that still the case or did you end up seeing people of different demographics, maybe even younger? You know, most of what we saw, of what I saw in the hospital in New York with coronavirus patients, especially who were very sick, they did tend to be older, uh, 70s, 80s dementia, diabetes to begin with, heart and lung disease. They really were pretty sick. A lot of folks were in a nursing home to begin with and pretty deconditioned and not in great shape. That is true. Now that said, I did have one patient that was a 20 something year old healthy female who got uh, myocarditis, who got a form of heart failure from coronavirus. She recovered and was discharged and lived. So of course she did better than some of my patients that unfortunately did not. But Overall, I think that's true. I think what, what, what I saw does um, corroborate with older and medical conditions. And there's all kinds of social factors, too. You know, we haven't talked a lot about that, but it does run along lines of poverty and race, access to health care, um, the neighborhood that you live in, your ability to distance, you know. Are you in a neighborhood that is on top of each other and people are more likely to get sick? These factors, I think, matter, too. We had patients, you know, we haven't talked a lot about this, but this matters too. We had patients who were on drugs, who were alcoholic. That's also medical conditions that are going to make it harder for them to survive and recover. And thank you for mentioning that. I mean, there are a lot of skeptics out there that say they don't want to continue sheltering in place. They want to reopen the economy. Um, some possibly don't even believe the extent of what the reports are saying, you know, how uh, deadly this really is and how easily people can get infected. What would you tell the skeptics in terms of uh, whether we should continue quarantining or why healthy people themselves are having to stay at home as well? You know, what I would tell all of us now as we're just flat out stir crazy from being home quarantined for so long is, first of all, good job, you flattened the curve and it's made a difference. Lives have been saved. Secondly, we can't do this forever. We can't stay at home forever. I agree with that. The economy has to be opened up. But we've got to do this in a way um, that is safe, that is cautious, and really that values everybody's life. And, and really, to be honest, we're talking about you know the vulnerable and the sick and, and really the weak, which is old and people with medical conditions. A lot of this push that I'm hearing, it's coming from younger, healthier people, and it's coming from, from business people. You know, this is kind of the young and the powerful. It really is sounding to me like it's pitting kind of the powerful against the weak. And as a doctor who in New York saw these people dying, like the people that are going to be dying, it's, not the, it's, it's less those with resources who could stay away from it or who are young and healthy. And it's really more those that really are vulnerable, old, sick, and weak. How many, how many people are going to die? Like, at, at what point is it too many people from the way that we're reopening the economy all over the country? I just worry about that. 
I think it, it needs to be done in in a way that is consistent with what experts are saying, with good things like contact tracing, with good testing in place. Ella, it worries me. People are going to die from the way that we are opening the reopening the economy right now. Like I've seen this stuff up front. It is a nasty thing. It's going to rebound. It's just a matter of how much is it going to rebound and, and how much do we as a society value those lives. There's no guarantee that we're going to have a vaccine to this thing. The flu vaccine is, you know, a good one is 50% effective. Now, I'm hopeful that we can have a vaccine. It would change it. But 50 or 70% immunity in the population, we're, and we're going to sit and wait for a vaccine. I mean, this thing's going to linger for a long time. And the more that we disregard the good strategies to keep it from going around, the more dead bodies we're going to have, man. This is a nasty, that just... The, just, I don't know. And maybe I'm traumatized. Maybe the, like the suffering that I saw of the people dying of this and their families not being able to visit that. There was a no visitation policy in the hospital unless they were actively dying in that day. And we had families that came in and did that. And I'm glad they spent that time. But they couldn't be there. I mean, it's just it's horrible. It's a horrible way to die. You're seeing this sort of death up close and personal. Is there a stigma in asking for help or getting help for people in your field? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, you talk about that superhero, super, you know, Superman complex, like, boom, like I want to be the <laughs> hero and be bulletproof and be all of that. But this stuff takes a toll. I will say the doctors that I work with, like, they also had adapted and they had adjusted, like, it freaked me out a lot the first few days, but then like something weird happens. Like as animals, we survive, we adapt to the environment and survive. Like we do what we have to do. And then I think you get a little space from it and you've got to process it and take care of yourself. You know, like you can't always be the doctor. Sometimes you got to be the patient a little bit, take care of that, process that, figure out like, you know, how am I going to get through this and stay healthy and take care of myself while also being on the front lines and taking care of people who are often very sick. This is nothing new to emergency medicine. Um, unfortunately, patients die and they die all the time. And it's part of the job is how can you keep doing the job and take care of yourself, take meaning and it still connect with people and patients, even though you know some of them, you're not going to be able to save. It's that's not new. It's just a lot of this stuff is more intense in a mass casualty situation. I mean, that's really what that was in New York. Well, now you're back home in the Bay Area, but you do have to get back to the stresses of your real life. What's that been like in transitioning from what was, I, I would say, a historical experience in New York City and then coming home and having to deal with, you know, the menial day-to-day -day stuff? Um, you know, being in New York on the front line of this thing was special there was it was all the ups and downs that i've talked about but it was a thrill and it was like a meaningful thing for me to do in my life to, to be able to serve in the middle of this whole pandemic to come back to that is is just coming down off of a high and it's funny you know the metaphor of my life is sometimes my car <laughs> that like it came back and like the radio was broken my car just broke down this week actually it's dead it's gone, my 2001 Civic I bought before medical school. So it's like coming back from this amazing experience to real life, you know, like anybody else. I'm quarantined. I haven't seen my daughter in months because I don't want to get her mother's family sick. You know, I'm, I'm single. You can't date right now. And so, like, things slow down. And like anybody else, like, I come back to this kind of twilight zone quarantine reality. Well, Dr. Burchette, take this time very well deserved and earned to relax. You deserve it. And, um, and hopefully you don't have to brace for another surge like that. But again, thank you so much. You're one of the many heroes on the front lines. And it's been a pleasure to really talk to you and come to understand what exactly we're faced with in this novel coronavirus. You're watching Cronon, the Bay Area streaming news 24-7.